Good evening. Fall River Community Media is pleased to sponsor tonight's forum featuring candidates running for Fall River School Committee. My name is Keith Tebow, Director of FRC Media, and I'll serve as the moderator for tonight's event. All candidates were invited to participate. The candidates joining us tonight in alphabetical order, Kevin Aguiar, Rebecca Collins, Mark Costa, Paul Hart, Joshua Hetzler, Thomas Corey, and Tim McCoy. We did hear tonight from another candidate, Michelle Larravee. Unfortunately, she had a death in her family and regret regretfully is unable to make it tonight, and we wish her and her family all the best. Also joining us tonight is a panel of journalists who will be asking questions of the candidates. They are Lynn Sullivan, Editor-in-Chief at the Herald News, Mike Sylvia from the Fall River Reporter, Donna Mata, FRC Media, Alan Zarek from WSAR, and Pam Martin from FRGTV. Also joining us tonight as our timekeeper is Lucy Cabral. The format for tonight's forum is as follows. Our forum will last 90 minutes. There will be no opening statements, but each candidate will be allowed a 90-second closing statement. Each candidate will answer every question presented by our panelists, and will have 90 seconds to answer each question. There will be no rebuttals. Prior to each question, we will randomly draw a candidate's name, and that candidate will answer the question first. Then we'll work our way around the table until each candidate answers the question. Candidates will be asked to answer a question first only once. In the event that all candidates were not selected to answer a question first, there'll be another drawing from those remaining to select a candidate who will present their closing statement first. Again, if all candidates did have an opportunity to answer a question first, we'll put everyone's name back into the cup and we'll draw a name on which candidate will present their closing statement first. So let's get started. The first question will be asked by Lynn Sullivan and it will be answered first by Tim McCoy. Lynn? What is one program or service that you would cut from the budget and what is one you would add? Tim? One service I would cut, um, Lynn, I can tell you what I would add first. Uh, I, would, I would add um, all day pre-K services to all families who are interested in taking part in pre-K programs. As you know right now it's a lottery and we do have some families um, that have been left out. Um, you know the, the, the one program, if you wanted to call it a, a, a program, but it's more of a student policy. As I said in the debate last week, I would eliminate the, um, the use of cell phones at the elementary and middle school level during school time. Um, I would ask that they be powered down uh, during the day and uh, they can power up when the bell rings at the end of the day. Uh, as far as at the high school level, I do believe kids with cars could be responding to a family emergency. And again, I would have to, if re-elected, I would have to speak with administrators at the high school to work on a cell phone policy at that level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin Aguiar. I would eliminate would be the bridge program at Durfee. I think that we've all known for several years that the program hasn't been working very well. So we've, instead of getting rid of it, we've morphed it into something different. We've changed it around a little bit, but I do think there needs to be an overhaul at Durfee High School with the uh, bridge program in particular. Along that same vein, I do think we need to increase, a program that I would increase is alternative education. We have too many students that go to high school right now, that, basically all schools, but it mainly uh, manifests itself at the high school that they are not able to be in a regular classroom. We need to have other options. It's not a one-size-fits-all school. And uh, ultimately, Durfee High School is struggling. I think we need to make some improvements, but I would increase alternative education. Now, to the credit of the current committee and prior committees, the uh, school department has been increasing alternative education, which I think is a great thing, but it definitely needs to be expanded. So that's a program that I would add, and it actually goes in kind of nice with the uh, bridge program, because if a student is at the main high school and they cannot exist in the regular high school, we've tried to make a program in the bridge. I would say let's remove those students that are causing disruptions and not interested in being in school, and let's put them in an alternative education where they could thrive. 
Thank you. Ms. Collins? Um, uh, as I stated uh, last week, I agree with uh, Tim uh, in some aspects with the cell phone policy. I currently believe that I don't think cell phones should be allowed at all in um, any of the schools uh, K through um, uh, high school and the um, and the program that I, I think that I would add is a home something to create a home um, to school gap with the pre-k through three kids to try to instill um, the need to bring um, parents from home into the education of our, our of our students okay. thank you mr. Costa thank you and thank you for the question Lynn you know I think as a member of the school committee we're constantly evaluating all of our programs whether they're effective or not and so I agree uh, with Mr. Aguiar that I think the bridge program is one that we've identified as an area we probably could do better in us utilizing the resources that we have at the high school to assist students um, that are currently in that bridge program. I personally would like to see that relocated down to our RPA program. Um, I think those resources would be better suited in that environment. Um, I know we've tried to accommodate the students at the bridge at the high school for, for a number of years now. We just don't seem to be getting the traction, and I think the numbers have dwindled. And as a result, we're pouring in resources that I think would be better served um, if we re relocated the program. So that's one that I think that I would advocate that we change or morph into something different. One that I would add, you know, I've talked this about this, I believe it was last week in a previous forum, but I really think there's funding out there and available <coughs> talking with Senator Rodericks for a mental health clinic. I think the needs in our district are profound when it comes to students who are coming to school day, day in and day out who are dealing with social and emotional issues. So I'd like to see us adopt an in-district mental health clinic for services to provide additional support for those students that are struggling, uh, whether that be psychiatric service, mental health counseling. We have that happening now in our district through outside vendors, but I think a more centralized location for those students would be better served for the district. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the question. Thank you, BCC, for uh, this venue. Thank you, Keith, and for the folks asking questions and the folks that are watching on Channel 95 on FRC Media. Also want to send my condolences to Mimi Larrabee's family, and um, uh, we're, all, we're all praying for her and her family. The, uh, I, I'd have to check out, I, I agree with what Mr. Aguiar said and um, what uh, Mr. Costa said about the bridge program, but having not been there in about four years as, a, as an elected official on the school committee, I'd like to maybe talk to the superintendent and the folks at the bridge program to see where the faults are and where they're lying right now. Um, and then I could maybe come to some kind of decision. And that goes for all other programs as well. The program that I would add, I agree with Mr. McCoy, um, it is absolutely the pre-K program. I'd like to make it a citywide program. I'd like to see the Student Opportunity Act pass, uh, hopefully in the next two or three weeks with the uh, House of Representatives. It's a game changer. It's gonna add $15 million to our budget over the seven years, and we can absolutely expand the, uh, the lottery program as it is now to a citywide program. Thank you. Mr. Hetzler. Well, I can't think off the top of my head what program I would get rid of. I, I don't have one at this time that really bothers me enough for me to want to say, let's get rid of it. Now, I've heard rumbling about the bridge program. I've heard of, you know, differences and discrepancies of different programs, but nothing comes to mind right away. One thing I would like to add, though, for everyone in the schools is I'd like to see CPR AED training as a high school requirement for graduation. I'd like to see uh, all of our students be able to leave high school not only with an education but with the skills necessary to maybe save someone's life if they're in that particular instance and they're called upon to act and i'd like to go as far as making sure our teachers are trained all of our teachers not just you know some of them and i know that comes with a price tag but i think once we get that rolled out and most of our staff is trained then training new employees becomes a little bit easier and less costly um, and again having the students with that training would be really good so stuff like that i think is uh very beneficial to our community. Uh, those students go out there now and they'll be able to help. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Corey. Yeah, um, I think that uh, Mr. Aguiar is very astute in, in naming the bridge program. When it got set up several years back, it never got supported properly. And uh, it's been a difficult program to run efficiently ever since. There's new leadership in place and we have been actively looking at it and making changes as we speak. Um, it's not perfect, but there's a little bit of movement to improve it right now. So that's one program that I would have no trouble eliminating. Um, CTE, career and technical education, is a direction that I'd like to see the school department uh, 
put a little bit more money and thought and, and programs into because uh, if we could identify kids at the middle school level who may uh, be very proficient with hands-on education, we could really train them very high to become highly skilled once they reach the high school. And when we get the new high school open, it's going to be a, a state-of-the-art facility where hands-on education, such as welding and carpentry and cosmetology and culinary arts, could be really highlighted and get these kids prepared for 21st century, real-world American jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be asked by Meg Sylvia at the Fall River Reporter and will be answered first by Rebecca Collins. Mike. On average, teachers spend about an extra $500 out of their own pocket to make sure the classrooms are well supplied. What can we do to make sure that they don't have to spend any money at all? I think the easy answer to that is that the Chapter 70 money is coming down the pipeline, so that's kind of, you know, uh, it's an unfair question to ask me because in previous years all these, these um, uh, school committee members had to really kind of search and struggle to uh, find, find money to uh, fund these classrooms, but I think that um, uh, that's one way is to take some of that Chapter 70 money to make sure that these classrooms are prepared and ready um, for the learners to come inside. But the other, the other piece is um, there, might be a, there might be a way to go out to the community, let's say, um, and have a classroom uh, sponsored by a, um, a local business. I know um, that Mayor Correa went around and asked for um, a sponsorship to get the flags put up in downtown and all that and so I think I wouldn't as a business owner have an issue at all if somebody came up to me and asked me for $500 a year to sponsor a classroom in the city. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Costa. Thank you Keith and thank you Michael for the question. Um, no doubt our teachers have consistently been altruistic. Um, I think by nature teachers are a profession that want to help and so thank you to those teachers that have consistently supplied their students with their needs. Um, I would say this, that in years past, with the limited Chapter 70 funding, it was difficult to make sure that the resources necessary for all students across our district were being met. Um, I think we've seen a change in that in this fiscal year um, with the uh, infusion of, of health care money that wasn't expended on the city side. We received one-time money. Um, the district's been able to put that to good use, um, whether, whether it be Chromebooks in the classroom for students, increased technology, um, the, you know, the reality is that the teachers shouldn't have to do that, that a district should be able to support uh, education in the classroom. And I think um, I've seen less of it, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening across the district. But uh, going forward, I, I think, as Mr. Hart has mentioned, uh, with the Student Opportunity Act, we will see an infusion of additional funds. Uh, my hope is that um, we can use uh, outside either donors choose, which some teachers utilize. We're constantly approving uh, grants for those uh, for those classrooms. But I'm hoping we'll, teachers will rely more on that and not taking out of their pockets because the jobs are tough enough to have to do it. But then to give back financially, I think, is an extra burden. I don't like. I wouldn't like to see going forward on on teachers in our district. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Thank you very much for the question. Absolutely, I will reiterate pretty much what they've said. Um, the, the, the Chapter 70 program uh, in that T Student Opportunity Act is going to help out uh, incredibly. And I, I will only vote for, for certain funds to be placed to classes only, whether it's supplies, whether it is you know, uh, the pre-K program, or any other program that helps the children in the classrooms and adds more paraprofessionals, adds more teachers to the program, to, to, the, to the schools as well. Um, I will not. I, I will also talk to the teachers if I'm, a, a grant, you know, fortunate to be elected again to see what their budget is um, for them for themselves for that for that one year, and then I think you know maybe working with them, working with the superintendent and the other school committee members to maybe alleviate the cost of, of what they're what they're spending and hopefully to eliminate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hetzler. Thank you. Uh, so I don't want to see teachers spend five hundred dollars of their own money you know, if they don't have to. Sometimes the teacher's gonna choose to do something in their class very special and they're gonna wanna go out and get those supplies that they need and it's something that the district might not have. So there's a number of ways I think we could address it. One, um, if it's something special that the district doesn't have in place, I think that maybe they should be reimbursed for it so they could, you know, submit the receipts for what they purchased. And I mean, I think there needs to be some accountability there and I'm not sure exactly how that looks, but I think reimbursing the teachers for their, the supplies they bought 
barring they provide the receipts, will be good. I also think that the district itself can maybe put out a survey asking the teachers what supplies they most often buy. And if they all seem to be buying the same supplies that you know, they're spending their own money on, we as the district can stockpile those supplies somewhere and they can come to us and we'll hand them the uh, resources they need for their classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Corey. It's an endearing question. Uh, teachers always reaching into their own pocket to, uh, to help their classroom efforts. Um, teaching is a noble profession. It has been and I hope it continues to be. Um, yeah, the, the, the great teachers are selfless and unconditional and do what they have to do to make their classrooms work. The Student Opportunity Act coming down is no joke. We've been pressuring the state legislature for the past several years. And I'm proud to say that once I got on the school committee two years ago, I've worked closely with our superintendent and our FREA to uh, drive the issue even more as we attended meetings in Quincy with the MTA and we hosted lawyers down here in Fall River to create a court case to challenge the legislature to make them look at this Student Opportunity Act and give Fall River a gateway city. It's due funding because gateway cities have been inequitably funded for far too long. And so we're very grateful that this is coming down. It's going to provide a, a, a real wealth of extra money in our district that we're going to have to be accountable for and efficient with. However, hopefully the days of classroom teachers uh, reaching into their own pocket will vanish. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McCoy. Michael, great question. Um, quite frankly, it's ridiculous in this day and age that teachers still have to do this. I think it starts with better budgeting by the principal at the, at the particular school. Every, as far as I remember, every course center, every school would have a line item for supplies. It is in the very nature and DNA for a teacher to go above and beyond. It is a calling. It's not just a profession. However, to think now that, you know, the, the potential boom that will come in Chapter 70 money should take care of buying supplies when it's probably going to be for new programs, for personnel, for professional development, for a diverse population. You know, I'm sure everybody on this board would give up a couple months of their school committee stipend to help with school supplies. But again, quite frankly, there has to be things in the budget that can re be removed. I was part of a school committee that removed out-of-state travel. I'm sure we still have in-state travel for seminars. That's just one thing that comes to mind. If you have a teacher that is actually struggling to supply a classroom to support learning, then we even have a bigger problem than I thought. If we were able to survive during a recovery plan in 9C cuts, and I'm sure Mr. Cost can remember those days, and I'm sure Mr. Agia can remember those days, we should be able to fund supplies for classrooms in this economy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. Assistance that make very little money. We have counselors. Uh, everyone in the school department loves kids and they love their profession. Someone said it, I'm not sure who, but ultimately they're going to give extras when the kids need it. Uh, the difference now versus what used to happen in the past, and I think where this question was coming from, is the, the necessities for a classroom used to have to come out of the teacher's pocket, whether it was 500 or more, or whatever it is. Those days are over, and they should be over for good. So we no longer have to ration paper, ration supplies, you know. People used to have to copy on both sides of pages, all these different things, oh, those days are over. So I do think that we need to address any kind of issues. If there is someone that has necessities in their classroom that they don't have for their children, there's a process for that. The principal would get notified, the principal comes before the school committee, the principal is the site-based manager of that building, and they need to present. We need X amount of dollars per classroom, and they have to budget that item. Uh, thankfully, based on the help from the state and the city, that we have a pretty good, robust budget right now. So I think the days of rationing paper and all that should be over, and it should be over for good. Thank you. Donna Mata from FRC Media will ask the next question, and it will be directed first to Paul Hart. Donna. Some students and their parents opt for a charter school education. What practices do charter schools practice, so to speak, that you'd like to see mimicked in the Fall River school system? A uh, great question. Um, and again, the, uh, the there's, there's two charter schools in the city of Fall River. 
Um, the issue that I, I have maybe with the charter schools, and I'm all for parents' choices, all for that, no question about it. Uh, the only issue that I might have with the, uh, with the charter schools and when it's funded and they add more tables, more chairs to the uh, classrooms and to the, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the school itself is I want to make sure that um, the city, the Florida School Department, is not losing any funding because of that. I, wanted, I want the state to reimburse the school. Of the, if we're losing seats uh, to the charter schools, to, we've got two charter schools in the city, if we're losing seats to the school and to the classrooms, I want to make sure we're reimbursed for those, and a lot of times we're not, and I think that's very unfair. Um, for, for school choice, all for it, no question about it, but that's, those are just one of the issues that, that I have with the, uh, with the charter school. Thank you. Mr. Hetzler. I don't know of any programs that the charter schools have that we don't have. I, I'm not aware of them. Uh, none of my kids go to a charter school. Um, my two oldest go to Diamond, and so I know there's shops, but we have some trades now uh, in Durfee, and you know, we're looking to expand. The only thing, and I don't want this, but one thing they do differently is they get to decide who goes to their school, where we don't have a choice here in the fall of public schools. We will take every child. So when a child is sent out of a charter school or you know a vocational school or whatever it may be, they come to Fall River, and it's our job to educate them, and we're going to do our best to do that job and uh, make the community better for it. Thank you. Mr. Corey. I, I don't know too much about charter schools, but I do know that their offerings their course offerings and their enrichment programs um, do not rival those in public education. Uh, they simply don't have the budget to sustain uh, the wealth of the athletics program or theatrical programs or music programs such as we do in the public schools. So I know that parents go charter for school choice. There's a lot more choices available in public education which I've always been a strong proponent of. I'm a product of it, and uh, so are my four children, product of uh, Fall River Public Schools, and uh, I feel like we do a great job educating the whole child. Thank you. Mr. McCoy, you have could a question I, first? Could I please have, before my time starts, could I, can you please repeat the question? And parents decide to go the charter school route. Yeah. Uh, what I'm asking is, what practices do charter schools utilize that you'd like to see in the Fall River school system? I'm not sure if it's an actual uh, a practice or program or delivery of their education, but perception is everything. I think, and, and I, I too, am, I'm, I'm happy that folks in the community and parents have some school choice, but let's face it, there's a perception that it's more structured, higher discipline. Those are the things that we have to work on. We, we've done some of the things that the charters have, have modeled. I mean, a very basic thing is going to spirit wear. I was part of a committee that did that years ago. Um, and many parents, even with some initial, initial you know, uh, uh, negative feedback, for the most part, once it get off the ground, you know, there's less distractions with fashion and what's being worn and things. You know, a simple, simple thing, but again, to keep the learning day a little bit more focused, you know, um, I am, what concerns me, and I'm, and, and I'm sure it concerns others on this stage tonight, is you have a publicly funded school that is not accessible by everybody via the lottery. Um, you know, I mean, I live in the Maplewood section. The high school um, that I can walk to is almost like a taxpayer-funded prep school at this point. Not open, really, to the public. I mean, it's locked up at the end. Of the, I'm not aware that you could walk on their track or use the facilities of the general public. And again, that's something that, that concerns me, that there are students being left out. I think there are other issues when, again, as Mr. Hetzel stated, when there's kids that they can't serve, we have to find a way to do it. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. So uh, as far as new and innovative programming at the charter school, I'm not aware of very many. Uh, I think that has something to do with the lack of collaboration between our administration and the charter school. But I also think many years ago when the charter schools were uh, implemented, that was really the mission, was they were going to try things that we don't typically do in a regular school. Then we were going to be able to see what works, what doesn't work, and be able to pull from there. Quite frankly, I don't think they're doing very many things that are different. It doesn't mean whether it's better or worse. I just don't think that they're doing all that many different things that we can learn from. Uh, I think in some ways, if collaboration, they might be able to learn from some of the things that our great teachers and staff are doing in our schools. So I think that's one of the issues. The other issue we talked about was uh, when you talk about choice for parents, 
we really got to take a hard look at why do parents choose to bring their students and their children to one school versus another. That's from K to eight as well as the high school. I think we need to step up and do a study of some type to look at the landscape of what, what are the purposes of all the different schools and why are students going to one versus another. When you look at the, um, the charter schools, they can make some regulations that we don't have. We can't make those. If we had a policy book the same as one of the charter schools, the, we wouldn't be able to do it, trust me. So uh, I think we need to have a level playing field ultimately, and I do think that it, I would call on our own central administration to do a study of from K to 12, why are people choosing to go where, and what can we do differently to make it better for all students? Thank you, Ms. Collins. I think um, one of the things that I think that the charter schools and some of the regional schools do very well uh, when they were soliciting my kids, for instance, there's a there's a firm marketing plan when it comes to these schools that uh, give us the option as parents and as students to um, go through the schools and visit the schools and see what programs they offer. And um, we don't do a very good job with that with uh, the public schools currently. I think what we do now is this is the public school and this is your choice, this is your neighborhood school, this is your school of choice um, option. But one of the things when um, my kids were entering middle school, one of the things that I liked about um, one of the charter schools is the fact that the parents and the children had access to, to teachers after hours. There was a cell phone, uh, there was a text uh, availability and an email availability that these teachers um, could answer questions um, for students in reference to homework, because a lot of times, you know, uh, a kid is sitting down at six o'clock at night to do their homework and they're not, they don't have the opportunity right after school to do it and have access to those teachers. So that was, that's one program that I think that um, if we could implement, I think it would be very helpful to parents and students. Mr. Costa. Thank you, Donna. Unfortunately, this question, I sort of left batting last in the lineup, but I will say that I agree with a number of things that have been said this evening. <clears throat> Primarily, I think when you talk to parents who choose charter, this is ex there's an expectation that it's somewhat better or that it is better than the public schools, and, and I would push back and challenge those parents on that as I had in the past. Um, you know, I think some of the things that they do in charters, we've attempted to replicate. We tried to keep our class sizes down, tried to um, make our instruction more individualized uh, for students. But someone mentioned it. The reality is that they can hand select students that go to charters, and we don't necessarily have that luxury. We educate students regardless. Um, and so, you know, could we do better? Absolutely. Um, but I would say that, you know, I, th I think the, the education that a student can get in the public schools, my three children have either been in the school system and I have one that graduated from here. And I would say to all the parents whose students go to charter school, that's your choice and preference. But I think we're doing a great job in our schools. Our teachers are making an impact in students' lives. Our students are going off and graduating and going to Ivy League schools. So the notion or perception that charters are better, they may have some more flexibility because of their charter, but I'm not necessarily sure that if you put apples and apples together that they're doing a much better job than we are. Thank you. Alan Zarek from WSAR has our next question, and it will be answered first by Mark Costa. What should the district be doing to encourage parents to read and interact with their children, ABCs, numbers, things like that, before they begin uh, public school? Great question, Alan. <clears throat> I guess I, you get what you wish for, so I was last and now I'm first. So <laughs> what I will say is that has to start immediately at birth. Um, and I don't know that that's happening quite often for, for a lot of our students. And so um, the earlier you can, I mean, study show, the earlier you can impact the student, particularly with literacy, the more successful they become. The sooner they are able to read for content and really understand what they're reading, um, the more successful they are in education. And so I think that the line is drawn around fourth grade. The unfortunate thing is many of our students aren't receiving that early literacy. Um, and I think you've heard members of, the, of this panel tonight talk about pre-K and early literacy programs. I'm a firm believer in that. I think the sooner students get in the classroom, get acclimated and, and increase their literacy, literacy skills, the more successful they will be. Um, so I would say, Alan, we need to be attacking that right at the Parent Information Center. Students are coming in, they're being assessed. I think we need to identify students who are, who are at, uh, excuse me, at, at, or who are at a disadvantage li with literacy and target those students for early intervention. Um, whether that's through our schools or through outside services or push-in services, if you will, the sooner we can impact students 
uh, in their literacy proficiencies, the more successful they'll be. Mr. Hart. Thank you for the question, Alan. I'm a huge, huge believer. Parent involvement is, uh, it starts right at home. Uh, it starts off when, when they're born, uh, when they get to, I, I believe, maybe when I, I think my child, my boys were four months old, five months old, three months old, I was reading to them. Uh, they probably didn't understand anything I was saying to them, but as they get older, the more you read to your, your children, whether it's an hour a day, 30 minutes a day, you've got to do it. Your parents have to get involved in their child's education. It's the most important thing any parent, any father, any mother can do for their, ch for their children is to learn for them, to read to them. Um, and, and of course, what Mr. Costa was saying, um, I'm a major advocate for the pre-K a citywide uh, program for um, pre-K, uh, for pre-K, and I do believe this. Do, these statistics do show that um, when you are reading to your ch child, or the child uh, at three, four years old is in a uh, uh, organized program, they are much better off in the in the uh, kindergarten, entering kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade. I am a big fan. I, I can't stress it enough to the parents out there. Please get involved in your children's education. It is the best thing that you can do to them. Thank you. Mr. Hetzel. Thank you. My colleagues have already said it. Now, the, the sooner the better. Right? I have four kids. I remember many nights reading books to my children. Started off very young, and it doesn't stop, right? I mean, until they're really out of, well, maybe like third or fourth grade, it starts to slow down once they learn how to read on their own. I'm actually amazed at how well my second grader can read right now. Uh, it really it blows me away. So um, the earlier, the better. Uh, Pre-K is obviously huge and will help out all the students because they're already getting introduced to stuff. So unfortunately, sometimes some of these students, they don't have the supports at home that they need. So it falls on the Florida public school system and the community partners, you know, the community pre-K centers like Head Start to try to get these kids where they need to be, where many parents get their children before they attend kindergarten. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. Um, so the earlier they can read, to the children, the better. If they can get them in an outside pre-K program, if Farber doesn't have room, like I mentioned Head Start, I went to Head Start when I was a kid, my two oldest went to Head Start. It's a huge advantage for any student. So the earlier, the better, the more often, it's better. Um, can't be stressed enough. So if anybody's watching tonight and they haven't done so yet, please read a book to your child tonight. Thank you. Mr. Corey. As a retired school counselor, I can absolutely say that the psychosocial life stages of early childhood development are key to the whole child as they get older. Infant to toddler, toddler to early childhood, early childhood to later childhood, and then early teen years. It goes by so rapidly. As we get older, the life stages stretch out, and we don't have to go through those stages as rapidly as the early development. So a parent has a great responsibility in early childhood conditioning for their child. So I would say, like my colleagues, read, 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 smile, hug, show love, compassion, and gratitude. Your child would be the better for it. Thank you. Mr. McCoy. Uh, thank you. Great question, Alan. Uh, much of it's been said, but again, speaking, reading, also, I think as a family, powering down electronic devices at night. Encourage your child to read. Encourage verbalization, yeah. discussion amongst one another. Encourage them to express their feelings. Ask them how they're doing during the course of the day. Um, you know, don't be, uh, I, I, I fully get in our busy lives today, it's not the easiest thing to do. Parenting, just like educating, not easy, not easy. It takes a lot of work. Uh, and even then, you're, com you're combating social issues, outside influences, what, and, and whatnot. Um, I agree with what others have said. The quicker we get our hands on children, I think the better. But again, teach them to verbalize uh, about their feelings. Crisis resolution, if you have multiple children, parents are doing it, and it via instinct. But ver verbalize to the kids exactly what you're doing in their interactions and whatnot, how to foster respect and, re and positive relationships, inter-family, inter-community. Again, I, I, I think that that is a positive start, helping us to, um, to do what we can and mold the children once we get them. The other, the other thing is obviously parent-teacher evenings, most of the focus is on education. Let's have some additional meetings, you know, bring your younger sibling to school, introduce you. them to the school atmosphere. Thank you. 
Mr. Aguiar. I think this is an issue that's not only for the schools. I think this is a citywide issue. I think all elected officials, all state representatives, everyone that has any kind of decision-making authority in the community needs to take this to heart because I think we need to do more than just wait till they get to be five years old or four years old and get into the school. So I think we need to change the culture in the city. I think the uh, stress and the importance of education always sounds good, but in reality, we have too many families that are struggling in a number of areas to actually do that. I think when we look at the job market, creating better jobs, quality jobs for our community, so that people don't have to be working three jobs. Some people are single parents trying to just make ends meet, working two, three jobs to survive. When you have that in a, in a situation, it's gonna be very difficult to be nice and relaxed, to sit home and to read to your children in the morning, uh, in the evening. So uh, I think we need to work at increasing family values in our community. Uh, I think everybody wants the best for their kids, but sometimes life gets in the way and they're not, they're not realizing the negative effect that they have by not doing some of these things. I think we need to work with the schools when we talk about reading. We can have more programs in the schools to teach a parent how to read. It's a lot easier to have them read to their children if they know how to read themselves. So we have to raise the level of all that. And I agree with everyone on the pre-K opportunities. Once it gets to that point, we need to start earlier. We need to get the children in there as early as possible so that when all of this other stuff is going on in their life, the most stable place they can be is in a pre-K classroom or a K classroom to learn how to read. Ms. Collins. I think to um, go on uh, what Mr. Aguiar was saying, uh, the fam I understand the family, family values dynamic of it, but that's not really what this committee is here to do. We're here to talk about the education piece of it, and I think that maybe um, an after school, an, an after school program or maybe some summer programs, because there is, you know, there's a there's a big learning loss that happens over the summer um, because we put these kids in um, after school. Frankly, my kids are in full time uh, daycare opportunities over the summer, and I think uh, maybe some co collaborations with Sir Jobs to help us, because we're we're telling us all, all of these people to read and read and read to their their kids. How many of these people have a fourth grade reading level themselves? So I think um, bringing some, again, I'm going to be a dead horse with this, but uh, some of that um, home uh, collaboration with the schools to try to close that gap, because I think it's extremely important that we help teach these parents how to teach their children. Thank you. Thank you. Pam Martin from FRGTV will ask the next question, and will be answered first by Joshua Hetzler. Okay, this question comes from a theater arts instructor who I had a 30-minute phone conversation with last Friday night, and I can assure you she really cares. Occasionally, she says fine and performing arts teachers feel they are competing with athletic programs for the spotlight and for funding. <coughs> Is this a valid concern? Why or why not? And how do we even the playing field? Well, I think there's always going to be some conflict between theater and sports. Um, my children faced it at middle school level. Some days they were like, hey, I gotta stay for practice because my kids are in middle school sports, but I also gotta, after that's done, I gotta go right into theater. Um, so my kids were in the theater program as well. So are they competing for resources? I don't think there's a competition. I think that the theater program is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know they won't be here, but the theater people will come at me later, is one program, right? It's just theater, and they're gonna put on a performance. Sports, there's, Maybe there's six different sports, you know? So there's more students are gonna probably go towards sports because there's more opportunity there. Theater, maybe there's not as many kids interested in it. Um, if, I think we addressed some of this at our last school committee meeting where, where we recognized that there was some funding issues and now we, my, myself and the committee, we decided to uh, provide some resources. So hopefully they get some of what they need. If they need more, I hope that they would come to us and look for it. As far as competition though, I mean, you really, you have to you market it, right? You have to sell it because if the student wants to play um, soccer in the middle school and the middle school soccer program, you know, conflicts with theater, the student's gonna have to make a choice. So the schools themselves could work on trying to schedule things a little bit better, but at the end of the day, it, it, you gotta market it and, and really make a kid or have a kid make a decision and pick one program or the other if they can't do both. Thank you. Mr. Corey. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, I'm a huge proponent of the arts, especially as they affect student lives. Uh, you asked about the performing arts. Uh, there are two levels. The high school has always been a well-functioning program with a lot of financial resources because they hold ample fundraisers and they're also uh, reimbursed by our school budget as well. 
but I think the middle school programs are the ones that have been hurting financially through the past many years. And um, just last Tuesday at the school committee meeting, we looked at some available funds uh, that we had, and we were able to appropriate $50,000 to the five middle schools, granting each middle school $10,000 each for their performing arts program because I did hear the pleas from the people in the field. I did hear the frustration. I do see the work ethic they bring and, and the joy that they bring working with the kids. That's real, and we want to get kids involved in the theatrical arts earlier. So middle school is a great introduction to fine and performing arts, and we just <coughs> reimbursed them by $10,000 each school just this past week. So thank you very much. Mr. McCoy. Pam, thanks for the question. I think um, certainly if you go dollar for dollar, I mean, there certainly would be a healthy funding gap, right? I think you have a lot more children at a young age participating in sports, um, whether their interest wanes or not over the years. But certainly there's a tradition of athletic competition which is going to get you know a larger percentage of the dollar. Um, it's you know I'm aware that there was that 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 there was um, discussion uh, last committee meeting and you know I can I can state that the amount of dollars uh, that gone in the past I mean we had excellent arts and music teachers we would typically help um, students with musical instruments and things of that nature if if we have a situation where um, there is a hole or a gap in their funding then obviously you know we need to put them on a level playing field we need to give the the kids who have interest in in the in the arts and, and and in music every opportunity to expand that interest because again an interested kid and a focused kid is is you know you're going to have a well-rounded student who is likely going to be happier going to school and contribute to a positive learning environment so we will get funds to the kids um, that need it for performing arts. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. So uh, I, I do think we ha need to have equal access for a variety of activities, not just the theater, but across all activities that all students might be interested in. Naturally, sports are gonna be a little different because there's probably a greater volume, so you'll have more funding, as somebody mentioned, relative to the total budget, but we need to make sure we provide funding so that we keep these programs working. Uh, when we look at the uh, last school committee meeting, it shouldn't take a member of the community to come before the school committee two months into the school year, six months into the budget year, to come before us frustrated and then have to say, well, we didn't have any funding and all this other stuff. And when we ask the questions to the administration, the administration says, well, we, we knew, but we didn't know, and all these lousy answers, quite frankly. The bottom line is people are frustrated. It sounds like that question is, came from somebody that's frustrated. But the school department administration, in my opinion, dropped the ball on this because if there's a budget cycle that goes through, each school, if they had a need for a theater arts program and a budget for that, they should have put that in the budget via the ad school administration to the central administration and then come to the school committee. But we just voted on it because somebody came down in citizen input time. Thank God they did, otherwise the program wouldn't even be funded. But we got a question, how does that happen at a school committee meeting that a parent has to come up or an, a person from the community has to come up to tell us that we're not funding the program? Should have been done a long time ago. Thank you, Ms. Collins. I think um, one of the issues that we have with all of this is that the athletic programs have um, feeder programs and that they're established feeder programs through uh, far of a youth soccer and it used to be Millican Silver and now it's basketball and the Falcons football. Um, so there are these uh, youth development leagues that are happening and I think um, while that person is frustrated, I think there's a lot of good things happening in the community currently. Uh, there are some great um, youth uh, theater programs and there's some great youth uh, theater schools in the city. Um, Mike, kids uh, are active in um, a couple of those. Uh, so I think that while um, we're frustrated that it's not happening, and, and as Mr. Aguiar said, uh, the school system doesn't seem to be taking it as seriously, I think, as the community does. Um, but I think uh, through those programs that uh, are being done um, at the in the nonprofit sector, that those uh, kids are going to come in and want more, and um, in turn will be able to um, create a better uh, performance art performing arts program. Thank Mr. Costa. You. So, Pam, I would say it comes down to budgeting and, 
And so thank you for having that conversation with that individual. And I, I disagree slightly, I guess, with my colleague and, and uh, Mr. Aguiar in, in that someone dropped the ball with this. I think the budget was put together and it was given <clears throat> as, as many resources as it possibly could. It may not have um, been enough, but I think we would expect people, not only in our school system, but also in the public, if they see an area that needs improvement or it sees an area of deficiency, that it bring it to the committee's attention. Uh, and as a result, we are able to use one-time funding, um, in this particular case, $50,000 to support those programs. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of extracurricular activities for students because I feel like most, if they're plugged in, they feel like there's a purpose for going to school every day outside of the academics, they're more likely to be successful. Whether that's music, the performing arts programs, or, or student athletics, the reality is that we should be taking a look at all of our programs and making sure they're funded equitably. Again, someone mentioned there may be more students participating in athletics, and maybe that's why the funding is a little higher in that area. But the reality is we shouldn't dismiss the fact that there are students performing arts just as serious as those who play ball on a court or on a, on a playing field. So um, it's about budgeting. And I think this uh, school district's in a better position financially that hopefully going forward we can account for the budgets necessary so that they can have successful programs. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you, PM, for the question. It is, uh, it is a budget issue. Um, I remember being on the school committee uh, four years ago. Uh, being on the finance committee and the budget committee, and uh, we had uh, a lot of the schools come in. Uh, they let us explain, explain to us what their budget was, uh, we, and, and if there was anything to add. Um, more than likely, they'd never really added anything. They had their set budget. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think they, I was at that meeting, um, last uh, school committee meeting, when they did uh, accommodate the, uh, the, the person for the, uh, for the theater. Uh, but you can't compare the athletic budget to a, th a theater budget, uh, transportation costs, equipment. Um, but it, the, I will say, I, being, I was a, when I was a senior involved in the drama club, involved in plays, it's a fantastic extracurricular activity. A lot of kids take part in it, and they are doing very well with it. I think personally that it's thriving. Um, and I know we'll give them a plug in, I think on November 22nd, Lizzie Borden is playing at Cuss Middle School. Um, so they're doing very good things on the middle school level and the high school level. Uh, and I will definitely support the, the theater, make sure every uh, department's on a level, uh, even keel for, their, for what their budget is and what their department uh, requires. And I will personally meet with them. And, and now that the uh, uh, theater arts came up, I will personally meet with, uh, with, with the person in charge of that and talk to them. And before the budget uh, uh, talks come up, I'll see what they, um, what they want, what they, what they think they need, and what work with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Lynn Sullivan from the Herald News will ask the next question and will be answered first by Tom Corey. Are there any educational innovations that you'd like to see brought to this district, such as Chromebooks for All, uh, robust internship programs, something like that, that you've read about in other districts? That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, we have a new curriculum at Durfee that really broke out uh, last year, it was in the planning stages, but last year was a great year. The service learning program is a program that entails uh, the curriculums of math, science, English, and social studies. And uh, what we do is we get kids and we put them into internships throughout the community. And uh, they have to do their research based on the internship they're serving. And uh, they have to report out to their school teachers at Durfee. Uh, in all four disciplines in relation to their internship and their service learning. And uh, this is also tied into the enhanced civics education focus that's been going on. Uh, the state legislature reinstituted civics as a mandatory program for eighth grade social studies, something that is sorely needed because civics helps a, a school child feel the responsibility of society. And when they do, they generally embrace those duties, those chores, and they rise to the level. So we have a great service learning program. I'd like to see that program continue to grow and develop. And uh, as we all know, to grow and develop programs, we need funding. So yes, we will always look at those programs and budget them accordingly. Mr. McCoy. Hi, Lynn. You know what I would like to see in the, um, in the Fall River School District? I would like us to be a hub of, um, of a, um, of a uh, uh, 
increased special special ed programs and improve uh, uh, programs to to um, work with autistic children. You know, years ago we partnered with I believe it's the Walker Institute where we would attract uh, kids from other communities. You know, with the new Chapter 70 coming down, uh, I would love to see us uh, become head and shoulders above other gateway cities in delivering those type of programs. I think you could also create some income uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the district. It would take a massive amount of, of professional development money, in my opinion, to deal with such a diverse population. But I would love to see us as a, as a, you know, a, a magnet district, so to speak, to increase funds. And you know, I think most superintendents will say to you, someone who is just proficient and experienced and successful in delivering special needs education and working with kids on the spectrum nowadays is worth their weight in gold. I mean, really, uh, when you think about it, 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 their value is endless. I would love to see us excel and become a model for the rest of, of the Commonwealth in those two, in those two um, um, platforms. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. So I do think that we have to uh, look at what's happening in the 21st century, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, all those programs that we have in Florida already, we just need to multiply it and duplicate some of the programs that we have. Uh, ultimately, we need students to have internship opportunities. I think schools where kids can get out and actually see careers, decide where they want to go with college or to the workforce, I think are very important. And I think we have to make sure that our system allows for those opportunities. Uh, the Chromebooks, as you had mentioned, I think this year we might have purchased 3,000 new Chromebooks, some outrageous amount. So kudos to all those folks up there that are getting those ready for our, our kids. Uh, so the technology is there, but now we need to look at the basics of an education, basically get back to the basics of education. And one of the things I think is, uh, is really needed in Fall River is that we need to service our special education uh, students appropriately. We have too many classes that we call inclusion or we call that they're getting serviced and we have people servicing three, four different classrooms at one time. That's unheard of. I think we have to look at other opportunities around the state when you say look at other communities and look at the services that the special education uh, programs are providing in other places. And in Fall River, our special education programs uh, numbers are very high. So I think we need to put an influx of money into additional special education supports to make sure that these children have the same opportunities as those that do not have disabilities. Thank you. Ms. Collins. So I'm going to get a really geeky contractor on everyone. And um, I think a facilities maintenance plan is um, vital for our community. I think um, all too often previously in history we haven't taken care of these buildings. Uh, the, the, the state and the city has made a huge investment um, in all of these new schools. And I think it's um, extremely important to have a facilities maintenance plan in place to make sure that these schools are clean um, and that they're safe and that the technology is brought up to all schools so that all of these kids can get the, um, the education that they need. I think it's, um, it, it's important uh, for the life cycle of these buildings because I think all too often as we look at um, maybe one of the two of those buildings that were built in the, um, the early 80s and late 90s, we didn't do a very good job taking care of them. And now here we are um, having all these issues and having to now reinvest all this money that if we kept um, some, if we put some money in the budget and we uh, kept a, a, an eye on the goal to make sure that these buildings were all safe and secure um, for, our, for our students, I think that would be um, important, an important program to put in place. Thank you. Mr. Costa. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you for the question. So we talk about innovation, you know, that really needs to start in the classrooms uh, with teachers being empowered to make decisions about where their needs are. And so. I'm proud that I presented a proposal to the superintendent, was unanimously supported by the body, to set aside $200,000 uh, for this fiscal year to allow principals and their staff to look at their school improvement plans and determine what their needs are. And then write a grant or proposal to the superintendent and staff to assess the needs of that school. And that money will be awarded to each of the schools. It'll be open to all 16 schools. But I think it does a number of things. One, it gets money directly back into the classroom where it's needed. Two, I think it empowers students, uh, teachers, and their staff um, to do what we want them to do, to be the practitioners, to be the professionals in the classroom who know their students better than certainly I do and other members of this committee do. That money can be used for 
bringing back retire recent retirees to provide targeted interventions for math or ELA uh, services or wherever the, the principal or staff feel it's needed. It can be used for additional professional development. It can be used for purchasing curriculum materials that are needed for that specific school. Or it could be used, as you said, for Chromebooks. So uh, I think that's a way of, of utilizing funds. And we'll check the data. And if it shows that these programs are successful, then maybe that's something we build in next year as a, build, as a priority in future budgets. Mr. Hart. Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I am a big fan um, of the Chromebooks. I think that it's great that we uh, invested uh, uh, in, in the school department for, for those resources. Um, but I'm also a big fan of, you know, we, we are looking at uh, different programs and we talk about what we should do for the innovation uh, piece of the schools, um, what we should do for maybe the civics like Mr. Corey was talking about, which I'm all in favor of. But we also have to start paying attention to the special ed uh, population and the ELL population. Special ed population went up 20, is up 26.5% this year and ELL up 17 or 18%. When I was on the school committee, the numbers were not that high. I believe we might have been at 15%, 14%. It's growing and we got to start paying attention to it and we have to start get providing more resources for that particular population. And I will be, um, I, again, if I'm elected, fortunate enough to be elected, I'll sit down with the people in charge of those departments, the SPED and the ELL, the superintendent and my colleagues, and, um, you know, especially now with that, with the uh, Chapter 70 increase in funding, we can maybe provide more resources to those, to that population and accommodate them better. Thank you. Mr. Hetzler. Thank you. You mentioned Chromebooks, and I think they're great, and, and you see we purchased thousands of Chromebooks, and, and many of those Chromebooks were purchased. Uh, with donations, so that's great. As far as like new innovative ideas, as a member of the school committee, many times I look to the superintendent or some of our other assistant superintendents for those ideas, for those new innovative things. Um, if they mention something, then we look into it and we may choose to implement it. But in many cases, I think if you want to bring something to the district, maybe some of the, there's other things we need that aren't innovative necessarily, that are just fundamental, for instance, paras in some of the classrooms, maybe paras in every K uh, one and two classroom across the city, you know, just to help out. And I think, you know, we have many paras and where are they needed? Um, the out of district stuff, we're gonna talk innovation, bring in more stuff here. Because we send many students out of district to get special education. So if we can create those same programs here in Fall River, we don't have to send students out of district, which means we can also, not only will we save the tuition costs, we'll save the transportation costs. Uh, one excellent program that I think we're going to roll out next year is, uh, and one of the schools is going to be, it's like a bilingual program. So not only in that school do we have all our English language learners, but we're also going to teach all of our English speaking students Spanish by the time they get out of elementary school, right? And that program is going to move on. So stuff like that I think is great. Thank you. Mike Sylvia from the Forward Reporter will ask the next question and will be answered first by Kevin Aguilar. were designated by the state as requiring assistance or intervention. All but one fell into that category the year before. What is the core problem, and if you're elected or reelected in 2020, would be your number one um, priority item? That, uh, nobody, as I said at the school committee meeting, nobody's happy about the numbers of schools that are designated as underperforming or in need of support. But we have to dive a little deeper into those numbers. Some of those schools, there's pockets of excellence going on in our schools. Some of those schools, when you look at the numbers, they've really increased over the last several years with some different programs that they have within their school, whether it be the ANET system that is actually looking at data to see what each student knows at each checkpoint throughout the year. Schools that have had that resource that the school committee actually funded across the whole district have made greater gains than what other schools have made. But ultimately, I'm not happy with those numbers, but we have to look at doing something different. I've uh, told the superintendent I think we need to do something bold and um, not just you know, nibble around the corners of a little bit of the change here, a little bit of the change here, because the numbers need to go up and they need to go up really quick. And it's not only about numbers, the student achievement. We need our children to be able to learn and move on to be successful in their educational careers and in their professional careers. So if I'm elected, I'm gonna continue to put the pressure on the superintendent to make work with him and his administrators to make sure that we have the best people in place, both at the principal level, the teacher level, and continue to provide the supports. Uh, we just keep on kicking the can down the road a little bit, but I truly can tell you that 
the increased funding and the, therefore the increased support and staff that we have in all of our buildings is definitely making a difference. And you just have to look a little deeper than those basic numbers. I think uh, along what Kevin said, the kicking the can down the road, I think it's a slow process that we got into and it's a slow process that's gonna take us to get out of it. Um, I think again, as we'll all sit here and say, that uh, the funding that we're hoping uh, gets passed and comes down uh, the pipeline will help with coaches, will help with more paras, will give um, the uh, student to teacher or student to adult ratio um, more in the child's favor. But I, you know, I, I hate to be Pollyanna-ish about this, but there are, as um, Ms. Aguiar said, there are pockets of excellence and there are a lot of good things happening in these schools and it takes time um, to make these things happen and to um, have them uh, show within the scores. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's imperative that, again, um, we, we bring the parents, we bring, we bring the parents in. I think the teachers are working very hard and the administrators are working very hard. I think the students are working extremely hard. Um, but there are, there are issues with getting our parents involved and I think that's may, maybe where the coaching and um, some of that power can come in to try to explain to these parents the importance of education the importance to getting a child in every seat. Um, but again, if you look at all of the data, we are slowly increasing and making, making improvements. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question. You're absolutely right. We see some schools struggling year after year. And so what we do know about our school system is that the schools that in the past have been designated as chronically underperforming and have been put on a three-year turnaround plan and received infusing, infusion and additional financial support from the state, we can turn those schools around. So that's positive in all of this. The reality is that we don't want to see schools lose momentum as others continue to pull themselves out of those, those deficits. But, you know, a number of the challenges that we face that are attributed to that one single evaluation of the, of the, of the school district is attendance. And we know our attendance struggles. We can't teach these students if they're not in the classroom. Another thing we know is that we have a high transient population. And, and a majority of those students are in the schools in which we're seeing struggling happening. So those students are constantly in and out of our district. It's tough to get the traction necessary, and that's why the state gives you three years to do it. Um, but we do have the tools to do it. We have the staff in place to do it. Now with additional infused resources, my hope is that we can replicate those plans in districts. But we're never gonna really be able to, as a school committee, get a handle on the transient population. Students are always gonna come and go, um, and that's the reality. What we can do, and there's another contributing factor, is retention. We have to keep our teachers here. We train them, we need them to stay. When you have that turnover constantly of teachers leaving the district and new ones coming in, it's tough to get that consistency necessary to show sustained progress. Mr. Hart. Thank you for the question. I agree with Mr. Costa. There's no doubt this is a transient community. It wasn't like that when I was going to school here in the city. Uh, not at all. Uh, we were always, uh, you know, year by year, we traveled with the same uh, students in the classrooms. Um, so it's absolutely much, much different. I completely understand that. And he's ex exactly right on that. However, there is something wrong. Something's going on for those half of those particular schools having having issues and having a problem and underperforming so we have to figure out why that is happening and the way we figure it out uh, at least what i will do when uh, if i'm fortunate to get elected uh, again on the school committee is that we will, should maybe create some kind of a, 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 a task force or a group and meet with those particular schools. The superintendent will do that. Vice Chairman Costa will also uh, probably uh, ask to do that as well. Um, and I'd like to be, if I'm, if I'm on the school committee, part of that committee, um, and just find out before we allocate more resources to the schools, make, let's make sure there's a game plan, and I'm confident that there will be, uh, but uh, as far as uh, any resources from that extra chapter 70 money that we're gonna be receiving, uh, we want to make sure that there's a game plan before we allocate any resources to those particular schools. Mr. Hetzler. Thank you. So, you know, the results come back and it's well, Fort Worth hasn't really made substantial progress. Um, the number of schools are looking at chronically underperforming. I, if I look, when I look at the results, it looks, you know, it's like flat, right? We're not making progress, but we're not falling into a hole. We're not in this crazy decline, like we're spiraling out of control and there's no achievement. So right now, as much as I want to see improvement, I mean, I'm not happy with uh, any low grade. My, my child comes home with a C, I'm wondering why I didn't get an A. But I think we have the right tools in place now. I mean, we don't have enough resources, but we have the right idea. And I think our schools uh, were steady. We would see an increase in achievement if we didn't have so many students, uh, English language learners, and 
special education students who require a tremendous amount of resources. So, and I've said this before, I think you know, some of the charter schools and some of the surrounding schools, other than the public schools, kind of draw in our higher achieving students. So what that does for us is now we have lower achieving students and we have this influx of transient students and students who require a, no a tremendous number of needs. And that's why our results are like a flat line. So I think that we're doing okay. I absolutely want us to do better. I think when you see this money um, hopefully come down from the state, you're gonna see uh, this committee make sure we put the necessary resources in place at all the schools so that way, and especially the schools that need to turn around, can turn around. Because what it comes down to, as my colleague stated, was a lack of resources. And once you put the resources there, the schools are capable of turning around. Thank you. Mr. Corey. It's a heavy duty question. Straight up, transient population is real and uh, it requires an amazing amount of patience to deal with. So yeah, there's some of the schools are on that, that flat line, but I believe those schools are also working to their capacity because of the social engineering going on with the population in those schools. As my colleagues stated, um, English language learners and special education students, those numbers are way up and require a phenomenal amount of resources. Uh, what Mr. Costa said about teacher retention is real. The more we can retain teachers in our district, the more steady our classrooms look like. Big problem affecting so many of our elementary schools is chronic absenteeism. And so I want to plead to the parents, and I hope a lot of them are watching, I want to plead to the parents to send your young children to school each and every day so that students, so that teachers in the classroom don't always have to revisit their lesson plan and can try to keep that lesson plan moving forward, especially with state standards in place. There's a lot of pressure on the classroom teachers, so I support them. Chronic absenteeism is a real issue. I plead to the parents, get your kids to school. I think it'd be a real help. Thank you. Mr. McCoy. Mike, great question. This is where a minute and a half is gonna be a bit of a problem. As folks have said, absenteeism, transient student population, there are still kids pouring into Durfee for enrollment into the month of October. September was absolutely insane. You get a state that I'm proud to be from Massachusetts and have some of the most stringent academic uh, uh, requirements in the country, and we typically finished number one. But you gotta also remember in a gateway city like ours, folks have mentioned it, S sped children still subject to, there might be some accommodations, but still su subject to standardized testing. English immersion classes where maybe in the old days, a couple decades ago, you have Portuguese speaking kids and then more recently Latino children. Now you get a, you get a class of, of 25 kids that are speaking eight different languages and they're gonna be subjected to standardized testing in a very short peri period of time. It's almost criminal that at the state level you could com come up with a student funding formula and look at gateway cities and try to compare it to Hingham and, and put a price tag on what it's gonna to cost to educate a child. When in Hingham, there might be 18 kids in the, in the second grade class with a teacher in two paras. So I agree it's a problem. I also think teacher retention, you need a novel approach in this community. Stipends to help young folks with student loans coming out of college in return for staying here. You know, uh, uh, maybe tax credits and tax breaks for teachers moving into the community. There needs to be a community approach to combat flat scores and educational Thank achievement. Thank you. We'll have uh, one more question tonight. It'll be from Donna Mata from FRC Media. And everyone's answered a question first, so I put everyone's name back into the pot. And the person to answer the question first for this last question will be Kevin Aguiar. We talk a lot, of course, about education and teachers and students, but what about the parents? What tangible steps are put in place or will be put in place to make sure that you have parent involvement, especially in light of cultural and diverse backgrounds, language difficulties, and that sort of thing? The parents may not understand the technology the kids are using in school. What, what steps tangibly are, can be taken to make sure that the parents are involved with their students, or with their children's education? So I think a, a big part of this is the parent center. So we've had a, uh, an increase in parent workers. 
uh, outreach workers. So we need to make it a, a system where we have people that speak the language of the family, go into the families, talk to them so they feel comfortable with the school. Right now, a lot of parents are not comfortable with the school. It takes uh, leadership. It takes principals that have energy and principals that have uh, a desire to truly get in there and, and talk to these parents and make them work. I've heard case after case of pa some parents that come into school and they're opposed to X, Y, or Z that the teachers uh, and the te school wants to do, and a, a quality principal, administrator, counselor, teacher can actually turn that around. And so if you take a negative and turn it into a positive, and I think a lot more people are gonna get into the schools. We also have to increase wraparound services. School ends at three o'clock, but a lot of these parents are not available, so we need to do things to go out to the parents rather than have them come into the school. A lot of home visits, we're doing a lot more of that. Um, ultimately, it's just getting to, ha to know the parents and having a belief that, that we can work together to make a difference for our kids. We talked earlier about the um, economic, educational level of people. And in the community, unfortunately, we have a low uh, educational attainment level. We have to do more to get these parents to have their GED, to go to classes, to learn how to, to read, to write and speak English, all those things that we can do to get them more acclimated in the school. But it's gonna take a village, it's gonna take everybody from the principal, superintendent, to the school committee, right on down. Ms. Collins. I think, um, you know, frankly, I think Ms. Aguilar hit the nail right on the head. But um, I think in we're, we're talking about adding more truancy officers. I think it needs, I, I think that needs to kind of flip flop. I think by the time we're in a truancy issue, um, we're, we're almost too late. So I would like to see some of that funding go more toward uh, getting coaches and, and uh, paras involved in uh, home visits like um, Ms. Aguilar said. But I think some of it with the language barrier, and I know that a lot of these teachers um, through the Parents Academy had created a lot of workshops and they had, I had said the other day, they worked very hard at these and then you get into, let's say, an auditorium where there's nobody there. Um, but. Uh, uh, I think if we if we create maybe some webinars or we create something where they can learn they can they can learn from home or they can they can uh, do uh, parent teacher conferences from home so we can have the opportunity to be able to um, service these parents because a lot of them are probably afraid if a Cambodian um, parent wants to come in and do a uh, parent teacher conference is there somebody that's besides their child that's going to be able to sit there and be able to explain to the parent and to the teacher exactly what um, what what is being relayed to them. Them. So I think, um, I think as um, Ms. Aguilar said, there's a lot of wraparound, but I think we, we need to start earlier and we need to get coaches and we need to get paras into the homes and into the families and uh, give them the 21st century options to get into the school systems and not just expect them to show up between four and six and that's how all you're going to get. Thank you. Mr. Thank Costa. You. <clears throat> thank you, Donna, and thank you for the question. And I would say that, you know, certainly schools can be a very intimidating place for parents who may not have had a successful education themselves. You compound that with the fact that what we know about our district is that it's become more diverse culturally, ethnically, and so we have to be aware of that. And so we've infused a number of dollars in our Parent Information Center to meet those people at the front door, to make them feel welcome in this district. This committee, this fiscal year and prior fiscal years expanded the number of community uh, support workers who are bilingual, who can go out and do outreach to the home to make those connections with families so that school's not an intimidating place for them to be. If it is, it becomes a cultural thing. If mom and dad are afraid to go to school, maybe that's not a place that I want to go to school as a child. And so I think if we start to bridge that gap with our families, we start making our district mirror the population we serve, and that's a work that's going to be, have to be taken on long term. How do we put teachers in the classroom that mirror the students they're teaching? And are we doing enough of that? And my answer is no. And so we have to look at that as a district and set that as a goal and, and really start to improve upon that. Whether that's to reach out with community colleges or four-year institutions to build programs that help pipeline those teachers into districts like Fall River who really need to diversify who's standing before our children, then that's an, it's something we need to look at long term. But I, I think we need to demystify schools. We need to take the fear factor out of schools for parents, and hopefully that'll encourage their students and them to come and be more part of their education. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you for the question, and I'm all for what everybody has said so far. Um, and I, but I am also of the belief that the parent involvement, um, as di and as a diverse uh, community that we are in today, um, for instance, I'm, I'm a social worker at the Department of Transitional Assistance. Um, I have a lot of colleagues that speak Spanish, Portuguese, 
um, uh, other, other languages as well. And I know they have students here in Fall River. They are extremely involved in their child's education. I do think that we can overcome the language barrier because I do think parent involvement, when you talk about that, is universal. Everybody is going to be involved in their child's education. There's just a select maybe population that, that doesn't because of maybe what Mr. Costa said as far as the de we have to demystify that notion. And maybe they are afraid uh, to come to the schools and we have to handle that and we have to deal with that. There's no question about it. But the bottom line is you go to anybody in any household, what is more important than for their child right now, of course it's safety and it's uh, other issues like that and they're being fed properly and you know all, all those other hygiene, everything else. But the most important thing is their education. And the parent needs to do that. And they need to do it today. They need to do it now. And I, if I'm, again, fortunate to be elected, I will help with that. However, ro whatever road they want to take, I will go to their house myself and get them involved. But we need to stop thinking about different uh, uh, diverse com uh, communities. They're, they're very, very welcome in this, in this community, but we need to teach them parent Thank involvement you. is the first thing Thank for their you. child's education. Mr. Hetzler. Thank you. Uh, parent involvement's huge. Uh, I've been involved uh, for many years with my children since they started going to school. It's, in my opinion, it's the most important thing in education. Um, if you don't instill that level of importance in your child early on, um, you're going to lose them, right? Um, how do we get more parents involved? See, I wouldn't necessarily focus on getting the parents who are already involved involved because those parents are okay and their children are doing all right. But I think we can do a better job reaching out to the parents of the students who aren't doing as well. Personal phone calls, you know, um, going out of our way and asking them, hey, what, what would you like to do with the school? Hey, we'd like to get you involved. Um, reaching out to them and obviously we need translators, we need people speaking different languages, all that. And I know that all the, the paperwork that goes home, it's in all the different languages now and we're trying to accommodate um, every family. Um, we just got to continue um, engaging them and really trying to bring them in. Uh, maybe we have different cultural nights, maybe a school with a specific population of uh, students. We have a night that represents their culture um, in order to bring them in and just to make them feel in invited and welcome into the school at all times. Um, and we just, you can't give it up. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a job that just, it's going to be persistent. It's, a, it's all year. The, Principal's gonna have to reach out, the teachers are gonna have to reach out, we're gonna have to get the kids to kinda go home and say, hey, mom and dad, I wanna go, come on, we gotta go check this out, and, uh, and just keep stressing the importance of education, and hopefully the parents will get involved. Thank you. Mr. Corey. If I could echo my colleague's sentiment, parents do have a responsibility. I raised four children and made sure that each one of them woke up, dressed up, and went to school every day and did their homework or their responsibilities in the evening. Our schools are collectively creating an atmosphere of inclusion and wraparound services. They are very, parents are very welcome to go to our schools at any time, but especially for school-based events and functions. Maybe, Donna, we might need to visit the outreach idea in order to reach out to parents more. Let's bring our act to them, such as let's work with the housing authority Let's work with the Boys and Girls Club, with CD Rec. Let's visit those outposts. And the parents go there too. We can go there with school-based reports, teacher meetings, all kinds of stuff can happen. Interaction, interpersonal relationships. We have a lot of ways to grow, but we've been scratching our heads on this issue for a long, long time. It's, it's a tough nut to crack. Thank you. Mr. McCoy. Um, Mr. Corey's 100% right. We need to explore all sorts of partnerships to work with our, uh, our uh, diverse population. Um, I think we can, we can uh, try to improve um, education is in, a, in a few ways. Again, the outreach programs, I think we should have um, evenings where we have translators on site to work with to, to, to work with this diverse population. We take advantage of, of partnerships and credits with BCC and UMass Dartmouth. I think, you know, we have successful children in Fall River who come from these diverse backgrounds. We should look in reverse and bring some of these students back for at UMass Dartmouth, at BCC, for a small stipend to perform some of these outreach programs. There are also other conduits. You can, you can have links on our website 
to work with translators um, and, and other conduits to make sure that parental needs are satisfied. Um, explanations are, are, are provided in multiple languages. Um, there's a way to do it. It's not easy. It comes through a lot of partnerships. But again, I think the biggest asset is exploring our, um, our local community college and, and, and state colleges and saying, listen, the Fall River School District would like to pay you for your time working with some of our diverse families and get them out into the community. Thank you. Thank you. It's time now for our closing statements. And the first closing statement will be presented by Rebecca Collins. Uh, thank you, Keith. I want to thank uh, FRC Media and the panelists for the great questions. Um, I think one of the reasons I'm doing this is as a mother of four children um, who have been through or are currently going through the Farber school system and as a um, uh, owner of a fourth generation construction company in the city I have a very vested interest in the city and I want to see um, things continue to grow and um, continue to prosper because when um, frankly when the city prospers people like myself and all of these panelists prosper um, I think that uh, um, as, as, a, as a parent um, I think that I have a, uh, a good handle on what the needs are for children and for parents, and I think as a business owner, I understand uh, how to how to work a how to work a budget and a facilities plan. And if elected, um, I would love the opportunity to, as I stated earlier, to create a facilities maintenance plan and also uh, to work with the schools on initiatives to uh, see what we could do to uh, close that gap between home and school. Thank you. Mr. Costa. Thank you, Keith. Thank you to our journalists. Thank you, FRG TV, and to the candidates and the listening audience. I know that the single most valuable asset that a city has is a strong educational system. Um, and I believe that it's the economic engine that drives forward of success. For the past 14 years, I've had the honor and the privilege to serve as this community's voice on the school committee. In my tenure, I've always advocated for uh, funding that provides our teachers and re the resources they need to be successful in the classroom. And if elected, I pledge to continue to support the use of funds to retain the best and brightest educators, invest in curriculum that supports closing the achievement gaps that we talked about this evening, and supports the wraparound services for our special needs, English language learners, as well as our social emotional learners. As a student of the Fall River Public Schools and as a parent of three children who either attended or currently attend these schools, I believe in public education. As a parent, I share with you the hope that your children as well as mine receive a quality public education. That is why I respectfully ask for your vote on November 5th to return me to the school committee so I can continue the work of making this school district a better place, not only for your children, but also for mine. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, FRC Media, BCC, and the folks here asking questions and the folks watching um, on TV tonight. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Fall River. I attended all the public schools here in Fall River, Tansy Elementary School, Morton Middle, Durfee High School, UMass Dartmouth, and I received my master's in education uh, at American International College. I have two wonderful boys, Paul Hart and Matthew Hart. I'm a social worker for the Department of Transitional Assistance. I've served on the city council for six years and the school committee for four years. I believe I have the valuable qualifications for this position. Uh, and I just want to uh, uh, ask the folks out there tonight um, that I would greatly appreciate their vote on November 5th. And it was an honor for me to be on this panel. There's a lot of good people on this panel here tonight that are looking for, uh, for your votes. And um, I wish them well, uh, but I wish them that I'll, uh, you know, come, come ahead of them. But they're all good guys and good, uh, good women. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hetzler. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who uh, put this on tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's great being on here, answered some great questions. Um, I really would love to see the community support me again so I could serve again on the school committee. The past few years has been great. It's been an honor and a privilege. Um, I was born and raised here in Fall River. I went to public schools here in Fall River. I'm raising my family here in Fall River. I'm married to my wife, Michaela, who's an adjustment counselor, so I, I see what it's like to what an educator goes through, and I understand some of the problems she faces as an adjustment counselor, and she used to work in the district. My four children, uh, Lorelai, Evan, Andreas, and Gwen, have all gone through the public schools, are in the public schools now. Um, so, you know, I know what it's like as a parent with your students. I, I see what they're going through. I know some of the challenges they face and some of the things they tell me about at school. I'm a former firefighter, and I'm a licensed contractor, and I ran a small business. Uh, I was very successful. So, 
I think I have um, a skill set that I can bring to the school committee and it helps me make good decisions for the community. Um, I like to focus on safety a lot with that fire background. Um, I'd like, I think the construction background helps, helps me out when I make decisions when it comes to facilities and maintenance. Um, and I just want to continue to make Farmer Public Schools a better place um, for all the children. Um, one thing I, I do want to continue to fight for is to bring the students that are going out of district back in district. Um, it's huge. I, I don't like sending kids 20, 30 miles away. Please um, consider voting for me November 5th. Thank you very much. Mr. Corey. Uh, as a retired educator, I have a deep inside view of the needs of our schools, our teachers, students, staff, and programs. Throughout my career, I have earned a reputation of positive action and delivering on my word. I have approached my role on the school board in much the same way. The difference now is that I see things from the outside. So for me, serving on the school committee has been a labor of love. I have worked thoughtfully and diligently over this past term to improve our school system for Fall River's greatest assets, its students and its teachers. I will continue to advocate for what works. I will fight against what does not work. I will collaborate with my colleagues to get things done. I respectfully ask for your consideration of your vote on Tuesday, November 5th, for my reelection to the Fall River School Committee. But before that, I'd like to thank Keith, FRC Media, the panelists, and BCC for hosting this forum tonight. And I certainly want to send my condolences out to our candidate for school committee, Mimi Larravee, uh, and her family at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McCoy. I want to thank FRC Media, BCC, our panelists, our viewers at home. Uh, I would also like to express, express my condolences to Mimi Larravee and her family. Um, I believe experience matters. Uh, I served on a school committee that went through a difficult financial times recovery plan, working with outside consultants, um, Dr. Kelly at the time, Judge Fernandes. I can recall working with DESE administrators like Dr. Conley. Um, I feel that as a former um, substitute teacher and someone who's worked in law and banking uh, and uh, the field of social work, I provide a diverse background, a well-balanced background to bring rational, reasonable oversight to the school department, the superintendent, and our budget. Uh, my name is Tim McCoy. I'm a graduate of Bishop Conley, Providence College, and New England Law, Boston. I respectfully ask for your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. So I want to say thank you to for FRC Media and to the panelists for the questions today. And I want to especially say thank you to all the candidates on the stage here today, not only for their professionalism, but their willingness to serve. We do owe each of the candidates a debt of gratitude. To the people of Fall River, let me say thank you for your past and present support of my candidacy. As a member of the Fall River School Committee, I do my homework. I ask the important questions, and I advocate for our students on a daily basis. The Fall River Schools continue to face many challenges each and every day. I offer my service uh, I offer my services to assist in meeting these challenges directly each and every day. I have experience working full-time as an educator at the elementary, the middle, and the high school levels, and I currently serve full-time as a high school vice principal. My experience with our education system, the legislative process, and my passion to make a difference for the children of Fall River makes me uniquely qualified to continue serving as a member of the Fall River School Committee. On election day, I respectfully ask for one of your six votes. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you all. I want to thank the candidates and the panelists tonight for participating in tonight's forum. Special thanks to our FRC media staff, Steve Rice and Michelle Dumas. I also want to thank Sean Elliott and his staff here at Bristol Community College for hosting tonight's event. You can watch a replay of this forum and find out more about all the candidates running for office in Fall River by tuning in to FRC Media Channel 95, as well as our website, frcmedianews.org. For those watching live tonight, we invite you to join us on Wednesday as we will present two forums featuring the candidates running for City Council. Our first forum will begin at 6 p.m. with the second forum at 8 p.m. Also make sure to join us on election night as we'll be partnering with our colleagues at FRGTV, 
to provide live coverage of the election results. For all of us here tonight, I'm Keith Tebow. Have a good night.